Welcome back to 30 Minute Money. On this episode, we're talking with wealth psychology expert and coach Kathleen Burns Kingsbury. She's founder of the KBK Wealth Connection and host of the Breaking Money Silence podcast. She's also an internationally published author and speaker, and her latest book is Breaking Money Silence. Uh, her fifth, uh, which you should go out and pick up immediately. Um, and she also hosts the podcast of the same name. And you can reach all of that at the same uh, web address, uh, which is breakingmoneysilence.com. Um, in addition to all of that, uh, one of the things that I found most fun about her profile is that uh, Investment News named her as one of nine amazing conference speakers. And I can <laughs> testify from firsthand experience. She is both an amazing speaker and an amazing person. So KBK, welcome to 30 Minute Money. That is so sweet, Steve. It's so fun to be here. And I'm excited to have this conversation and break money silence with you. Well, I really think that this is going to be a tremendously valuable topic for our audience. So I appreciate you joining me. So let's just start out with, so, so what actually is money silence and why do we want to break it? So money silence is that uncomfortable feeling that many of us get when we're talking about finances. And some people it's talking about the dollars and cents, the actual numbers. Uh, more often it's about talking about the emotional side of money. So what money means to us, or if we're having a conflict about money, you know, being fearful that we're uh, fighting about it or disagreeing about it. So money silence really gets in the way of uh, individuals being able to take care of themselves, talk to their financial advisor, learn from their mistakes. Couples often fight about finance, and that's a leading cause of divorce, so that becomes a problem. And when you look at uh, families who are passing down wealth, 60% of families fail to pass down wealth over generations due to the lack of family communication. So in other words, due to money silence. So I really see it as a problem. It can be solved, but a problem that impacts individuals, couples, families, and our society. So I'm on a, a journey to make sure that we can break through this last taboo. Oh, that's great. Well, I know, you know, as a financial advisor, I know that, you know, talking about people would rather talk about sex and they'd rather talk about death more they, you know, they're more comfortable talking about those than they are talking about money so i know it's a big deal and and what you're pointing out is that you know even among ourselves even in those intimate relationships of a partner or parents or those kinds of things there's still a lot of reluctance to talk about that and you know people say that there aren't that many taboo topics for millennials but you know i mean for this for this generation is it is it is it still one of them it is still one of them. I do think millennials uh, have the right idea. They just don't tend to have a roadmap for how to talk about it. And the reason I say that is there was one study that said 70, 71% of millennials said they agreed with the statement that society would be healthier if we talked more openly and honestly about money. But when then you look at what people's actions are, they're not quite there yet. Um, but there is certainly hope because millennials certainly have broken through every other taboo. So I think we can break through the financial one. Right. Well, and <clears throat> I mean, people say a lot of things. I mean, I, 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 you know, I've heard somebody credible say that, you know, the world would be a much more peaceful place if everyone played a ukulele, which I agree with. <laughs> but, but is anybody going to do it? Well, probably not. Just there's that little fringe <laughs> of us that are interested in that kind of thing. So, but, but let's talk about the stakes. So, so. If you're reluctant to talk about money with your partner, with your parents, those kinds of things, you know, what, what, what are some of the problems that can come up when, when that happens? Well, you know, like I just mentioned, uh, couples can have conflict and one of the leading causes of divorce is financial conflict. So I'm not saying every couple that disagrees about money is going to end up divorced, but it is an area where it, when it gets tricky, it often symbolizes other problems in the relationship. Um, I think it's hard when we talk about women, um, especially talking about money and talking about money at work and negotiating their salaries, it can actually impact your ability to make money, to save for the future. Um, with families and aging parents, we see it a lot, and this is something that certainly um, I've experienced as well, is it's really hard to talk to your aging parent about their finances and their estate plan, but when you don't, it's really hard to help them and be able to uh, have them uh, age the way they want to and also have them pass on the wealth the way they want to. So there, there's a variety of ways in which it trips us up. 
Um, I don't really think there's a good reason not to talk about money. I think we're just all used to not talking about it. And it's been passed down for so many generations, this idea that it's rude or it's unnecessary uh, to talk about finances with people um, other than yourself, that it ends up being kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy, unless somebody like you is working with a couple or um, somebody, you know, like me or goes to a seminar or something and realizes, wait a second, we really need to do a better job of this. Yeah, well, and, and I, I think it I think it goes a lot farther than just this is not one of those things that we do. I mean, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of <clears throat> baby boomer clients um, uh -huh. who are, you know, approaching or in retirement. We talk about estate planning and talk about what they want to pass along to their kids. And we talk about, so let's get into a conversation with, with the next generation and, and talk about that. And it's not just that you know, that's not a proper thing to do. I mean, when we, if we, when, when they start talking about talking about the dollars that are involved, I mean, you know, freaking out would not be too extreme a term to use. So it's, I, I think it is, I think it is critically important just to figure out how to break through that because it's not, it, there, there are some really significant barriers. Um, they're Absolutely. psychological barriers. I think there's a lot of fear. And so when you're thinking of millennials, it's fear of either offending your parents or the fear of like even dealing with the fact that your parents are going to die someday. And for uh, the boomers or the parents, it often can be a combination of not having a roadmap, fearing they're losing control. And certainly um, some people really thinking if I talk, this isn't rational, but if I talk about my death, somehow it's going to happen. So I do think the emotional component to not talking with family members and loved ones uh, is really the complex piece, the piece that I focus in on, and the part that we have to kind of unravel in order to free ourselves up to have these conversations. And, and the other thing I just want to put out there is when you do break money silence, you don't have to have every conversation you've ever wanted to have the first time you do it. It's kind of a journey <laughs> over time, and you start really, really small, um, whether you're a boomer or a millennial and how you're going to engage in the conversation. Yeah, so let, let's talk about it. So it's not like an intervention, you know, so we're no, not going to no, no, no. tie no, down to the chair, 20, you know. And, yeah. yeah, not a 21-day so, <laughs> rehab experience, no. <laughs> That's right, yeah, it's the 10-day the, the purge or something like that. So, <laughs> so, 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 so let's expand on that. So what might a progression look like, you know, to, to, from, from beginning to, to break that silence up through really having an open conversation about money? Sure. Uh, there's a couple of things I encourage people to do. Uh, one of the things is the first step, I think, is we have to become aware of our own thoughts and beliefs about engaging in these conversations. And that's called your money talk mindset. So I do an exercise, whether I'm speaking, whether I'm coaching uh, and interacting with people, it's really around, you know, what are your automatic thoughts and beliefs about talking about money? Uh, what's your most comfortable financial conversation? What's your scariest financial conversation? And, you know, what do you think not talking about money costs you? So that's a short version, but it's kind of looking at these questions of what are my thoughts? Let's bring them to my conscious mind. So once you get aware of that, you can say, oh, well, I'm really strong talking about savings and maybe I'm not so great at talking to my aging parents. Uh, and once you're able to identify your strengths and your challenges, then you can reach out for help to build up the challenges or to enlist someone like an advisor to help you have these conversations. Um, I think the other thing is once you do the money mindset exercise, you can actually then approach someone and say something along the lines of, hey, you know, I did this money talk mindset exercise. And, you know, I'm wondering, what, did, what do you think about talking about money? You know, what did your parents teach you about talking about money? And what do you think it would be like if we started having these conversations? So before you even have the conversation, it's engaging in a dialogue about what would it be like if we did this thing called breaking money silence? And then the last thing I would say in terms of uh, breaking money silence, start small. You're going to want to pick a very safe easy, approachable person to start engaging in these conversations. Sometimes people start online. They, um, you know, join some sort of Facebook group and they start talking about it there. Or it could be approaching someone that you know is safe and just saying, hey, you know, I have a question about finance or do you mind engaging in this conversation? And, and you'd be surprised once you ask people, they're willing to go down that road with you usually. Um, but you have to ask and you got to take it in small little baby steps. So what, what kind of, <clears throat> what kinds of conversations are you, are you referring to specifically there? Because 
you know, again, as a financial advisor, I have people coming in all the time saying, well, I talked to this guy on the train and this is what he, you know, he told me that yeah. this, this, this is how mutual funds work, you know, which is not the way not they work. Correct. Yeah. Um, so what, so what, 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 can you elaborate on what kinds of questions you would bring up outside of your significant relationships to sort of get you going in that direction? I mean, I think one of the conversations that people can ask is really about, um, it could be about financial knowledge. So it could be, you know, a friend who happens to be good at finance or working on their budget. You could ask them how, you know, how do they budget? How do they save? Um, I do believe that the technical side of finance should be left to experts. So financial advisors, CFPs, that kind of thing. Um, but you can certainly ask about saving, spending, gifting, investing. You also... If you don't have to start there. And this is where I think a lot of people can have fun. That's where you start with talking about, you know, if you won a million dollars, what would you spend it on and why? Or, you know, have you ever thought about why we spend so much money on skiing or whatever your hobby is? You know, there's a lot of ways in which you can talk about money that don't have to be about the dollars and cents. And I find when you do that, Steve, people don't feel as defensive. They don't feel as um, shut down. Uh, where I wouldn't start would be, you know, turning to a coworker and being like, what's your salary? Eventually maybe saying that, but often, <laughs> yeah. or turning yeah. to your partner and saying, you know, I'm really mad at you for this. Let's talk about money. Um, we don't want to blame people. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we don't want to blame people, which is an right, easy exactly. to do when you're in a relationship. We want to open up the dialogue and just be curious. So I would say, get curious, keep the topics small and pretty concrete. Um, and just see where it goes. And if it goes nowhere, at least you've broken money silence. Um, right. And you can try well, again I, later. Yeah. And I really like, I really like that advice about a asking like the non-monetary questions yeah. about, you know, you know, I, I observe this and isn't this interesting or, you know, you know, why do we spend so much money skiing or, you know, I, I think, I think those are really helpful Helpful you can you can listen to music and there's a lot of messages about money and wealth and music. You can watch a movie and stuff comes up. I mean, if you start tuning into how much we pick up on money messages and they're floating around us, you will find something that's fairly benign to engage in this money conversation about. Yeah. So you you probably don't want to start with the flying lizards. I want your money. You probably <laughs> want to start with something a little a little softer than that is what I'm hearing. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Yes. Got it. Um so, so let's say that you start down this road and, and let's say that you're successful at it. Let's, let's, let's talk about the objective. Let's, let's talk, let's, let's paint the picture of success. What, what is, what is a healthy relationship uh, regarding money look like? I think that is such a great question. I will tell you my definition and I think everybody gets to decide what their own definition is, but I know for me, it's really about the ebbs and flows. So being aware being having basic financial knowledge, being aware of kind of the inflows and the outflows and, and being, you know, knowing that there's no perfect way to do this thing called money. Um, I also think it's being open to learning and being curious about other people's, uh, you know, financial habits. And here's the hard one. I think when you have a healthy relationship with money, you tend to judge other people financially less because it's about your relationship with money and how you choose to express uh, your different emotions, how you, the goals you want to achieve. It's not about the person next door. So it's not about the Joneses and keeping up with them. It's about what's going to work for you. And so that's why I say it's your own definition. It is something that I think each and every person should think about, like what would be a healthy relationship? What would be good financial well-being for me. And some people have slightly different answers and that's okay. Money is a tool, but the emotions around money and sure. what we think of money is just, you know, very varied. And that's what I think makes it kind of interesting and fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And so, <clears throat> you, you know, you were talking there to some extent about just being comfortable yourself with your relationship mm -hmm. about money and, 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 you know, exploring that a little bit. But of course, what we were talking about before was with partners. And I think that's, uh, I'd like to focus on that for a minute because yeah. that, that's really significant. Like you said, you know, the, probably the top cause of divorce is money. And so we want to set people up for success and, you know, have one of those healthy relationships. So at, at what point do you start to, talking about that? You know, I, I'm, I'm assuming, and I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm assuming that it doesn't have to be 
after you're married, but at the same time, you don't want to show up for your first date and ask for their, you know, federal tax return. So, um, you know, that would it, be romantic. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> have some roses. Let me have your tax return. Um, so it was, how, how do you, what's, what's a good time to start thinking about having a conversation like that? I think, you know, ideally it's when you're starting to get serious with someone romantically, you know, one of the big triggers is you're thinking about moving in together. Um, that means you're going to start sharing expenses or at least having to manage who's paying what. And so I think starting there is a good idea. Realistically, many people, unfortunately, don't start till after they're married. I, I don't encourage that, but it, there is no time that's too late to start this conversation. You know, the other big one is you're planning a wedding. If that's not one big financial conversation, I don't know what it is. And there's a lot of emotions <laughs> right. attached to it. So um, one of the things that I really wish couples would do prior to um, getting married or moving in or making a, a commitment is to think about what are, you know, what are my um, thoughts and beliefs about saving, spending, gifting, investing? And then what are my partner's beliefs? Where are we similar? Where are we different? And the, the beauty of couples that work well together, Steve, is that you can pull from each other's strengths. So I'll give you an example. My husband and I did everything wrong, by the way. So you can <laughs> ultimately end up a person writing a book called Breaking Money Silence and completely blow it in your 20s and 30s. And so when we met, um, we didn't talk about money. In fact, I helped him uh, file his taxes, but I didn't like coach him. I did it for him. So that's not healthy either. Then we got engaged and I decided literally the next day that I was going to open a joint account and then I was going to control it for about 10 years. <laughs> So that, that also, sounds pretty cooperative. Yeah, that yeah, sounds like yeah, a good, exactly. A good, that sounds like a good solid partnership. Yeah, right there's there. a there's a plan. Just to control. <laughs> so it was all unconscious, and so I was good at money. He was not good at money, and we just fell into our roles. Well, when we had a situation in our life where we got financially ripped off by a contractor, that blew apart. And the opportunity in that crisis was the fact that then we sat down together and thought, who's good at what? Let's pay bills together. Let's have financial meetings. So I think it's as a couple coming together and deciding what roles are we going to play. And the other thing that I think is important is you don't have to play those roles forever in your marriage. You know, to death to us part is a long time of balancing the checkbook. <laughs> you, <laughs> right, exactly. you can decide we're going to try this for a year and reevaluate how this is working. But I think the one thing that's important, no matter what tasks you're doing, that each of you meet with your financial advisor together at least once, if not always, but once a year, and you have periodic financial conversations about where are we at, where are we headed, just because I think both of you need to be aware of what's going on financially to take care of yourselves and what I what I think happened, well, what I know happened with my husband, I don't like to admit it, is that he's really good at money in certain areas and it tends to be the areas I'm not. So it's a nice balance. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah. And, and so let's dig into that a little further because, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll uh, you know, I'm, I've, I've, I've talked to lots of clients where, you know, one partner um, work, does the money stuff and the other one just really has no interest at all in it. And this yeah. is not meant to be sexist, but I mean, just in my observation, it tends to be the woman who just would rather have the husband do stuff. And we've also, you know, had plenty of opportunities to see that kind of thing blow up. Yep. And, and just to sort of counterbalance that, you know, there are lots of studies out there that show at, at the same time that show that women, in fact, are better investors and they are often better decision makers. And, and <clears throat> so it's, it's not that they're incapable, but there are just a lot of folks who are not that interested and they just, they, you have to drag them into the conversation. So I'm going to uh, jump in though. Yeah, I'm going to so, jump in before the question. Millennials yep. are changing that. When you oh, look okay. at the statistics, it often is more women than men. Okay. So it, it, there is a little bit of Great. a flip but still people aren't doing it together. So, right. so what's your question? I so the question is if, if you're in a situation where, you know, one, one partner is perfectly fine and happy to, to deal with that stuff and they're perfectly happy having their partner involved mm -hmm. in it and their partner just really wants nothing to do with it. And so, yeah, every time you talk about money, you've got to sort of drag them into it. Yep. So, you know, what, what's, what would be a good, a good uh, objective, a good goal for them to have about how they interact with money when, when one of them is just, just plain old not interested in it? 
Well, what's interesting being somebody in money psychology is if you're avoiding money that much, to me, there's something up, right? So okay. it is not health. That's not a healthy relationship with money to just say someone else can handle it. I use the analogy with my clients of uh, good nutrition. So we all as adults have responsibility to have good nutrition. We have to figure out what to eat, how to exercise and what, you know, do this in moderation, right? We don't have to become a nutritionist, but it's our responsibility to take care of our bodies. Mm -hmm. Same thing with finance. We have to have a basic level of financial knowledge, awareness, and mindfulness in order to be an adult around money. That doesn't mean you have to love it. Doesn't mean you have to do spreadsheets. It doesn't mean that, you know, one partner can't take the lead. But what it means is you need to be involved at some level. And that's where I think meeting with the advisor comes into play. It also could be having these periodic financial meetings, which by the way, should be short, like 30 minutes. It's not about having a fight. It's about where are we at? And it's also something that you want to pair with a reward. So each time you have a financial conversation um, with your partner, you're then doing something fun as opposed to you have a financial conversation and you, you just kind of dread it. Blah. You need to give yourself a reward that you've broken money silence. For my husband and I, we typically go mountain biking after we have our financial meetings. Um, but yes, you need to be involved in some level. And I think that you can't change somebody, but you can invite them to come along and you can let them know that there are a lot of risks for not taking adult responsibility. And I think you probably see a lot of those in sure. your <laughs> practice, Steve, right? Widows yeah. that are really blown away and have to learn about finance while they're grieving. That is less than ideal. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And and that and, and I have had a, a bunch of those cases where, mm -hmm. you know, a, <clears throat> I get introduced to a widow not long after she's lost her husband and she's never written a check. And yeah, that's the worst possible time to try to learn something new because, you know, you cognitively are, are not 100% exactly. because you're grieving. Yeah. And, and, and you really deserve to have that time to grieve mm -hmm. and get over the loss and those, and you shouldn't have to be developing a new skill that's going to determine your well-being for the, for the rest of your right. life. So, yeah, so I totally get that. One thing I will also add in there um, is that I, I, and I can't believe I have to say this because I can't believe it still goes on, but there's still a, a, an alarming number of <clears throat> women that don't a lot of enjoy going to the advisor because the advisor specifically talks to the man and even worse, sometimes will talk down to the women. And I will just say, if, if you are a woman and you're in a relationship and you don't enjoy going to see the advisor because they never address you or because they talk only to the guy, get a new advisor. That yes. you do not have to work with somebody like that. <clears throat> it's not right. It's not professional. It's not a, a way to professionally conduct yourself. And it doesn't have to be that way. There are plenty. I would, I would, I have no basis for this, but I would suggest most advisors are not like that. There still are way more than I would like to admit to. Mm. And I spend a lot of my time, as you know, Steve, training these advisors to not be like that because right. I think it's really important no matter how you identify or what your um, you know, racial background, sexual orientation is, that you have a safe advisor to talk to. And yes, there's a lot of advisors, I think, that are more old school that are that way. But yes, I think individuals who are listening here, you can hire someone that's going to listen to you, that's going to get you. It may not be perfect. You may have to use your voice and say, you know what? I really would like to focus on X, Y, and Z and mm -hmm. um, not focus so much on what we're focusing in on because it's, it's a relationship. But ideally, you'll find somebody who's able to check in and find out what you want to talk about and then be able to balance that relationship in those in those meetings. Yeah. Um before we move on, let's let's talk about one more issue between couples. And you'd shared with me a statistic before, you know, as we were getting ready for this show, that um, something like one in five Americans don't tell anyone their salary, and only sixty percent of women and fifty-two percent of men share their salaries with their significant other. Mm. I would Crazy. venture a guess that it's more like eighty percent of men probably inflate it, but <clears throat> uh, but that's uh, you know that's just uh, that that's astounding, and so. Uh, what 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 contributes to that and and what is it you know what's it a sign of and and how do you how do you break through that if if you've got a partner who just really is reluctant to talk about that 
Well, what's interesting about the salary is I think it's one of the most awkward, still taboo money conversations. If you had to kind of rank them, it's usually easier for people to talk about savings or talk about, you know, other things, but their salary feels so personal. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of reasons why there's this secrecy around salaries and secrecy with partners, but often it has to do with people measuring their self-worth based on what they make for a living and feeling either like they're going to insult the other person because they make quote unquote too much, or they're ashamed because they don't make enough. And as partners, you know, you think about it, you share so many things, you have intimacy, you have kids, you know, you share this life. And in order to financially plan well, you need to be transparent about what your salary is. And so, you know, that at just a base level is really important. I also think we live in a society, and this is starting to change, where historically companies would for, you know, forbid you from talking and sharing your salary, which by the way is illegal and has been for many, many years, but companies still do that. So it, it's kind of this mixed bag. So I've been working a lot recently, Steve, especially with women, but with people around salary negotiations, identifying their value, communicating their value, because I want to help them break money silence in this area. And as you know, if you're able to talk about money and negotiate for what you're worth, negotiate your salary and communicate that to your partner, your advisor, the people that need to know that information, you can amass more wealth, you can reach your goals, you can give back more because you're making more. I mean, there's so many positive um, outcomes of being able to, to have that conversation. And as an entrepreneur, maybe you have experienced the same thing. The more you negotiate fees and talk about salary, the easier it gets. It's just a skill that you have to learn. Yeah. And so let's talk about that <clears throat> in just a second. Just as an interesting aside, I, I, uh, this is totally cultural, right? Like, so we all think everybody is like this, but it's, that's not true. We in America are like this. I spoke in India a few years ago. Uh -huh. And so in getting ready for that, you know, studied up a little bit on some of the culture there. And it's funny because it's utterly, totally different. In, in, in Indian culture, you know, when two people that don't know each other get together and talk, salary is like one of the first things that comes up. It's wow. like, it's like, like here, that. That's awesome. yeah. So like here, it's like, so what do you do? Yeah. Over there. It's yeah. like, so what do you make? It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating. It's really interesting. So it is, to you know, it, it, it is totally a cultural thing. And so we don't necessarily have to get tied into that, but you mentioned, you know, talking about negotiating and, and I know that you do, you do work helping people uh, learn how to better negotiate things like salary. So specifically, how do you help women in business? Um, break money silence and 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 especially when it comes to those um, salary and uh, and fee discussions. Sure, I, I work both one on one as well as I have a master class on negotiating. Um, you could go to breakingmoneysilence.com backslash uh, negotiating hyphen masterclass. How's that for a short URL? <laughs> and find out more details about the masterclass. And the the reason I really like that is is you know and I do this one on one as well, but. We really start by looking at, like I said, your mindset. But in this instance, looking at your negotiation mindset, what are the, the conscious or unconscious thoughts that trip you up in engaging in these conversations? And then I take people through a process where they learn to have this conversation, but to do so in a way where they're able to identify their value in the marketplace, then figure out a way to have language around that and communicate that, um, to have support. Um, the reason I like the masterclass is it's a group of uh, it's specifically for women right now, but I may open it up as time goes on. Um, support where people can cheer you on and you can role play and you can practice. And then what I find is people go from having a low level of confidence around talking about salaries or fees if they're in business to a high level. And yes, they have to keep practicing, but it makes a huge difference. And I'm of the belief um, if, and this is why I'm so dedicated to women in negotiating, if we're able to each do a better job of negotiating, we're able to speak up and we can chip away at that gender wage gap. Now it's not going to solve it. There's systematic issues, but it can chip away at it. And I don't want to leave out the guys. I have worked with some men on this as well. In fact, I just got a text last night that someone just landed a new job at the salary he wanted. So um, it's just fun work. And uh, I want to help people do a better job taking care of themselves. That's awesome. Well, so. <clears throat> 
Um, you know that here at 30 Minute Money, we're, in, we're uh, big fans of 30 Minute Action Lists. And so yeah. if someone wants to break money silence in their situation, what are some of the things they should put on their action list? Okay. I think the first one is to sit down and whether you journal it, whether you do this visually, whether you just think about it, really think about what are the messages you learned about engaging in financial conversations, both about the technical side, so that would be the dollars and cents, versus the emotional side. So I think you just need to do an inventory. You could sit for five, 10 minutes and journal about it, an inventory as to what do I believe about engaging in these conversations? The next step I would have you do is identify what's one strength you have for engaging in these conversations, what's one challenge. And I want you to focus on the strength. And so then think about, the next step would be thinking about somebody who would be a trusted person that you could share this exercise with, because that is indeed breaking money silence. Now that may be your partner. It may not be your partner and that is absolutely okay. It may be your advisor, a coach, a girlfriend, a guy you play golf with, it, it doesn't matter. But just taking that extra step and saying, you know what, I'm going to just ask them, hey, this is what I learned from my parents growing up about talking about money. What do you think? And you can refer back to this podcast and say, I listened to 30 Minute Money and I'm going to blame Steve and Kathleen for breaking money silence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So can you bullet point that for us? So yeah. the couple of so tips the first, there. <laughs> the, first is, the first is doing a journal entry okay. around what did you learn growing up about money? Okay. Uh, the second is identifying one strength and one challenge in your money talk mindset from that experience. The third is to pick a safe person to share that exercise with so you can practice engaging in a financial conversation that isn't too overwhelming and um, is a nice start. Awesome. That's great advice. Um, so Kathleen, where can people find you again? Surprise, surprise, Steve. It's at breakingmoneysilence.com. And I just want to let uh, people know that if they go to breakingmoneysilence.com, there is on the homepage uh, a free program. You can sign up for 52 money talk tips. You get one small tip a week that helps you engage in a financial conversation. So I try to make it as easy and concrete for people because I really want people to get out there and, and dare to talk about money. It actually, over time, becomes kind of fun. Awesome. Kathleen Burns-Kingsbury, thank you so much for joining us here at 30 Minute Money. Thank you, Steve.